Hi everyone, um, we're gonna get started in just a minute. We still have some folks logging in, um, but welcome to Recruiting 101. And what we're gonna do tonight is just talk about some of the basics of getting started with recruiting. Um, we have folks on the Zoom channel as well as YouTube and Twitch, and any of those are fine. Just make sure that if you haven't already, that you go to southmountainlax.com slash college dash prep and register for the workshop so we can send you handouts at the end. So if you want the handouts, just make sure you register um, and then you can watch us however you want, that's fine. But we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're gonna start with some recruiting myths that are pretty common. And the first one is that lacrosse skills are the most important part of the recruiting process. Um, and that's really not true at all. Um, the most important part of the recruiting process would be academics and maintaining your grades. And I don't just say that because I've worked in higher ed for a really long time. It's true. Um, there are some tiny exceptions with some of the money-making sports, particularly football and men's basketball and that kind of thing. But um, for most sports and certainly for the women's sports, um, student athletes really don't get cut any slack in the grades department for being athletes. So you have to have the grades to get into a school if you want to play sports there. Um, so you have to get past the coaching review process to get recruited and you also have to get past the admissions process. So the better your grades are, the better your test scores are, the more schools can consider you as a student and as a prospective student athlete. Um, there are a number of groups that have done similar studies for um, all kinds of sports in general, like verified athletics and those sorts of um, groups. But I like this one that the um, Coach Damon from Lax Goalie Rat did um, because he reached out and did a study with a lot of college coaches around the country, lacrosse specific. And um, this is the data that he got back in terms of the percentages of schools that can recruit you depending on your GPA. Um, if you're wondering why the 4.0 is at 94% and not 100%, um, it's because some schools are women only, some schools are military academies that recruit a little bit differently, those kinds of things. So um, not every school could potentially recruit every student, so it's not quite 100%. But if you just look, for example, at the number of schools that can recruit you or the percent of schools that can recruit you if you have a 4.0 GPA versus a 3.0 GPA, it's a massive difference. So really the most important thing for kids who want to play lacrosse in college is to make sure you maintain your grades. Um, similar studies have been done with the SAT and it comes back the same. Um, there's a massive difference in terms of the schools that will recruit you if your SAT scores are 1200 or higher versus less than that. Um, and for students whose SATs are a thousand or lower, um, there's a dramatic drop in the schools that can recruit you. So again, um, do what you can to get the best grades you can, um, take the test seriously and get good SAT or ACT scores um, because it only increases your likelihood of getting recruited and you have a lot more colleges that can seriously consider you if your grades are good. Um, the second recruiting myth is um, a lot of kids think they need to play for the best club. Um, the one that has the most tournament wins, the most state championships, um, those kinds of things. The biggest social media juggernaut, whatever it is. And they think that if I don't play for that team, I won't get recruited. Um, and that's absolutely not true. There are all kinds of teams all over the country and lots of kids and not everyone can play for the team with the most wins, um, which in many cases isn't always the best team for you as a player anyway. Um, your best chance of getting recruited to play college lacrosse is to play for a club that focuses on long-term growth and development of its players. Um, and that's really what you need. Um, 
a lot of kids think if I'm good enough in high school and a coach sees me and thinks I'm ready to go, I'm going to get recruited. I'm going to play college lacrosse. Um, when college coaches are evaluating high school players, they don't actually expect you to be ready to go right now. They don't think that when you're a senior in high school, they could put you on the field with their starters and you're good to go. What they're looking at is how did you develop through high school? What's the improvement you've made? And are you continuing to show improvement? And do they believe with their coaching and their system, they can continue to get that improvement out of you so that you will continue to be a better player? And if you think of some of the best players in recent years that you can, um, you know, Taylor Cummings, Lizzie Colson, um, Izzy Skane, Charlotte North, any of these players, every single one of them was better at the end of their senior year than they were when they started college. Um, and that's what coaches are looking for. They're looking for kids that will continue to grow and develop all through high school and all through college. So go for the growth and development. And how do you know that a team is interested in your growth and development? Um, there are a few ways you can tell. So as a general rule, if you're playing for a club that has a feeder program, so they have youth teams, they have middle school teams, they have high school teams, um, and kids can grow and develop over time. And when you get to middle school or high school, they might start dividing teams up between kids who just want to play rec for fun and kids who want to play more competitively in tournaments. And that's okay, but they have a variety of teams, a variety of age groups. Those teams tend to be interested in growth and development of their players. Um, sometimes you'll have organizations that only have high school teams, but they're open to anyone and they might separate kids based on skill level. Um, and so they might have a team of older, more experienced, better skilled kids and other teams with newer kids, less experience, but anyone who wants to play can sign up and play. There's a team for everyone. Um, kids can move from one team to another as they improve. Um, those teams tend to be interested in growth and development. If, um, if a club team only has a high school team, it's only by invite only or only by tryouts. They don't have a feeder program. They cut kids. Um, those teams tend to be more focused on going to tournaments and winning, um, not necessarily long-term growth and development. Uh, Playtime. If you see clubs or play for clubs where whatever team you're on, the kids tend to get pretty equal play time. And again, it's not gonna be perfectly equal all the time, but, but if it's fairly equal and all the kids get to play in all the events, that's a team that tends to be focused on growth and development and everyone's gonna get better as a team. Um, if you play for a club team where you're, you or your parents are putting a lot of time and money into it and you go to a tournament, and you're getting five minutes playtime in a game, and that's pretty consistent. Uh, that's a good sign that the club is not interested in growth and development. It's interested in winning. Um, team assignments. Um, if a club has multiple teams, how are kids assigned to teams? Um, and what kinds of opportunities will the club or team give them for recruiting? So, um, if you're playing for a club and you're at a tournament and you all are getting mostly equal play time um, and a girl that is already committed is pulled off the field so another girl who's not committed can play because your coaches have noticed that a college coach has shown up, um, that's a good sign that the club is interested in growth and development and helping all the girls get recruited. Um, on the other hand, if you're playing for a club and you don't get a lot of play time and college coaches show up and your club keeps a whole bunch of committed girls on the field and has the uncommitted girls all off the field, um, that's a good sign that the club is more interested in winning than your growth and development or recruitment. Um, you can also tell if you look at things like score differential and play style. So um, we've all seen the club that is up 10 and two at the half and they come back from the half and you watch and team A that's up by eight points wins the draw and they don't run down and score on a fast break anymore. 
you see them pass the ball around. Um, every player gets a touch two or three times. Someone will cut hard in front of the cage, get the pass, fake a couple times, and then pull out without shooting. Um, teams like that um, tend to be interested in long-term growth and development. So they'll still have girls practice cutting, dodging, faking, um, those kinds of things, but they won't actually keep scoring on fast breaks. You'll see girls switch positions where they'll have the defense play attack. Um, they'll have the girls all go non-dominant for a while. Um, so as not to just keep scoring and scoring and scoring. Those teams tend to be interested in growth and development of everyone and giving everyone opportunities. Um, we've also probably all seen the team where same thing, they're up 10 and two at the half and we come back from the half and the team that's up wins the draw, scores on a fast break, wins the draw, scores on a fast break. Um, they're up, you know, 20 to two with a minute left in the second half and girls are still trying to score to break a record for most assists, most goals, most whatever. Um, those are teams that tend to be much more interested in winning and statistics and records than long-term growth and development. Um, so those are some of the easiest ways you can tell and kind of gauge. Um, but most girls are better off going for long-term growth and development. Um, the third recruiting myth, um, and this one I think really hurts a lot of kids. Um, and a lot of kids and parents, they just, they believe this to be true. And, and unfortunately, it's all too common of a myth. If I go to tournaments, college coaches will watch me play and I'll get recruited. And it, it's just not true. Um, uh, tournaments and even the bigger tournaments that have more college coaches, um, the bigger the tournament, the more college coaches there might be, but also the more teams and the more players there are and college coaches are really busy and the tournaments have games on a lot of fields at the same time in a very short period of time. And coaches only have so much time to watch kids play. So they typically have a schedule in advance of the tournament um, and they've got all kinds of notes marked up. They've got their schedule ready to go. They know several days, usually before a tournament, which games they're going to watch and which players they're going to look at in those games. And typically they don't even sit and watch your team play an entire game or half a game. In most cases, coaches are showing up, they're watching five, 10 minutes of a game and they're moving on to the next game and the next set of players they need to look at. And they're watching a lot of girls for a short period of time, quick, quick, quick. Um, you're not going to have a situation where you're playing a game and, two, you know, eight, 12 college coaches are just hanging out on the sideline watching the entire game. That's not going to happen. So if you want to get seen at tournaments by college coaches, you really have to reach out in advance and build a relationship with coaches, um, send them links to your recruiting profile, tell them about yourself, um, send them your highlight reel, tell them what team you'll be playing for at what tournament and see if you can get them to come watch you for a little while. But just showing up at recruiting tournaments and hoping that coaches will see you. Um, it, you might get lucky and a coach might show up at your game to watch some other player on your team or the other team who's been reaching out to them and you might be playing your best game and they might happen to notice you, but don't count on that. That's not the best way to get recruited. Um, the best way is to be reaching out to coaches in advance, building the relationship, filling out your recruiting profile, sending them the highlight reels, getting them interested so they will come watch you. Um, and it, that having been said, your best bet still with tournaments is to use tournaments to get a lot of growth and development. The more you play, um, the better teams you play, the more you develop your lacrosse skills, the better you get, not just skills wise, but decision making, all those kinds of things. Um, and you can get good film for your highlight reel. But some of the best ways to get seen and noticed by coaches um, and have them really see what your skill set is, is not at tournaments. It's at all these other kinds of events where coaches are. And those are things like... Um, the IWLCA, which is the Coaches Association for the Women's College Lacrosse, um, they have all their tournaments that they do, Champions Cup, Capital Cup, Southeast Cup, Midwest Cup, West Coast Cup, 
Southwest Cup, President's Cup, they do a million tournaments. And at many of those tournaments, usually the evening before, sometimes the day before, depending on the tournament, um, a little earlier, but usually the evening before the tournament, they'll do an IWLCA experience where it's a smaller number of kids with a number of college coaches and they go through a lot of different things. They go through some recruiting um, information, help advice, those sorts of things, but they do a lot of skills-based stuff, drills that are run by the coaches. Uh, but because the number of players that are allowed is so much smaller, you have a lot better chance of being seen by coaches for a lot longer period of time. Um, and those really um, kind of range in price. They're usually about 100 to $150 a piece but the IWLCA actually does um, scholarships. They do grants for kids. So um, if financially it's a little bit of a hardship and you're going to the tournament, but you can't afford the extra, um, you can apply for scholarships from the IWLCA. You just go right on the webpage for that tournament that they have set up and um, click on the experience and they have all the information you need about the scholarships and how to apply. Uh, but they, they do provide funding for a number of kids so that more kids can be able to have those experiences, even if financially it's a, a hardship for them. So that's a really great way to get seen by a lot of coaches for a longer period of time. Um, other kinds of pre-tournament showcases, both Adrenaline and 3D do a lot of showcases with college coaches before their tournaments. Um, and they tend to limit the number of people who can register. Uh, so again, it's a smaller group of kids with the college coaches. So you get more time and attention and more looks from the college coaches. Um, I don't recommend kids just sign up for every showcase before every tournament they go to look and see what college coaches are going and don't sign up and pay the extra money if there aren't coaches from schools you're interested in. But if there are coaches that will be there from schools you're interested in, it's a really good way to get noticed by those coaches. Um, Adrenaline tends to charge about $200 um, for each of their pre-tournament showcases. 3D is a little bit different. Some of them are free for kids who are competing in the tournament who register. Um, they still only allow so many kids to register to keep the numbers down, but, um, but some of them are free. Some of them are as little as like $25. Um, so they tend to be a little bit cheaper. Um, but it's the same kind of thing. There are college coaches running skills and drills. They keep the numbers down. Um, so you have an opportunity to get seen by college coaches. Um, Tenacity does a Western Winners Showcase, typically every June and December. And they're almost always held at the Claremont Colleges outside of LA. Um, this year, because California hadn't fully opened, um, they did their June one in Salt Lake City. Uh, but I believe in December, they're going back to the Claremont Colleges area. Um, for those kids can register individually or they can register as a team, but they keep the number of players they take down. Um, and they have a fair number of college coaches from a variety of D1, two and three colleges that will go to those events. Um, and they run a lot of the drills and scrimmages and those kinds of things. So you get seen by a lot of different college coaches. So that's another good way to go to get seen by college coaches in an environment where they're gonna look at you for more than five minutes. Um, XPO, Elite 180, Denver Super Elite, they're all camps that bring in a number of college coaches and have a limited number of girls that they take at any given time. Um, the XPO camps are typically in June in the San Francisco area. Um, the Denver Super Elite camp, as you might expect, is in the Denver area, it's typically on the DU campus. Um, that's July most years. Um, Elite 180 is June most years, and that's usually um, East Coast, New Hampshire kind of area. Um, Elite 180 is a really good camp. Lots of college coaches. They do a lot of recruiting workshops and those kinds of things, as well as lacrosse skills training scrimmages. Uh, it's very specific, however, the elite 180 camps, all of the co college coaches typically come from East Coast, smaller liberal arts colleges that are high academic schools. So if as a player, you're interested in those types of schools, the, you know, Bates, Bowdoin, 
Middlebury, Amherst, um, Tufts, those kinds of schools, that camp is a really good camp to get noticed by a lot of coaches and learn from a lot of different coaches. On the other hand, if you have no interest in small liberal arts colleges, if you have no interest in going to the East Coast, don't do it. It's a waste of time and money. Um, so if those are the kinds of schools you're interested in, it's a really great camp. If you're not interested in that area of the country or the smaller high academic liberal arts colleges, um, then there's no point in going because they're not bringing in huge research universities and those kinds of things. It's a different sort of camp for kids that want those kinds of schools. Um, uh, individual schools will also have prospect days that they advertise all the time. You can go on their college lacrosse websites, um, follow them on Instagram, see when they post that they're doing their own prospect days. And if there's a school you're really interested in and you can manage to get out there, um, that's another way to get noticed by the coaching staff of a school that you're particularly interested in. But all of those things are better than just showing up at a tournament and hoping a coach will see you. Um, recruiting myth four, the behavior or attitude of my high school or club coach, teammates, parents will not impact my recruiting process. Um, unfortunately, that's not true. Um, it's not just you and your skills and your behavior and your grades that impact how well you will do in the recruiting process. Um, the college coaches aren't just evaluating you, they're looking at your environment, they're looking at um, the people around you. So kind of keep that in mind as you're out at events. Um, what, what kind of high school or club are you playing for? Um, what are college coaches seeing when they go out to your games? Is your coach constantly screaming and yelling at the officials? Um, is your coach walking out onto the field? Um, I've seen it happen, not just as an official, but as a parent. Call, uh, coaches just walking right out in the middle of the field, screaming and yelling. It's, that's not a good look. If that's your coach, it's, they're not helping you in the recruiting process if they're walking out on the field in the middle of a game, screaming and yelling at refs. Um, it, it's just not a good look. If your coach is consistently getting yellow cards for their own behavior, it's, it's not helping you. How are the parents behaving? Are your parents on the sidelines screaming and yelling at the ref? Um, again, not a good look. Um, even if it's not your parent, are half the parents wearing your club team's shirts screaming and yelling at the refs? Um, it's, it, it suggests that that's probably not the best environment and you might be picking up some bad habits that um, might be a little bit concerning. Um, sometimes it depends on the tournament. Sometimes the college coaches have seats over by the score table where the teams are. Sometimes they're over on the other side of the field where the parents are. Um, sometimes coaches kind of move around different places so you never can quite be sure at some of these events where they'll be, um, but they watch and see a lot. And you, you don't want a college coach on the parent sidelines listening to your parent or other parents from your club team complaining about how awful the officials are, how awful your coach is, how awful some other girl on your team is. Um, it, it's just not a good look for college coaches to be hearing those kinds of things. Um, how are your teammates behaving on the field? Are they swearing at the other team because they don't like what they're doing? Are they swearing at their own teammates, yelling at their own teammates when someone drops a pass, misses a slide, whatever it is? Um, coaches watch all those kinds of behaviors. They're watching what kids are saying. They're watching body language. It's not just you. It's the team as a whole, parents, coaches, everything. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. Um, when you choose a club, when you go out to tournaments, um, it, it's unfortunately all too common where the, for a lot of teams, there's always that one parent. Um, it's really problematic if there's multiple parents causing problems, if coaches are causing problems. Um, it, it is a red flag. Um, a kind of side note for a lot of kids different recruiting profiles, or at some point you might want a high school or club coach to talk to a 
college coach about you, choose carefully which coach you pick to do endorsements for you. Um, you want a coach to be honest, to give an honest appraisal of your skills and abilities, um, attitude, character, emotional maturity, those kinds of things. Um, positive but honest um, is, is what you want. It's not really any different from what you would want if you're going to a high school teacher asking for a letter of recommendation when you apply to college. You want them to give an honest appraisal of your skills and abilities and potential, positive but honest. Um, you don't want a coach writing some sort of endorsement, basically saying you're the best thing since sliced bread. Um, I've, I've seen some endorsements that um, probably aren't really helping the student. So for example, um, you, you don't want a coach who's going to tell college coaches that you are such a good lacrosse player that they would put you in a one-on-one -on -one situation against any defender in the country and you'll beat them every time. Um, because, for example, when I see an endorsement like that, the first thing I think is, does this coach really think this particular high school player could go in a one-on-one -on -one situation against someone like Lizzie Colson a hundred times in a row and beat her a hundred times in a row? Um, I'm kind of thinking she doesn't have a shot at all of even winning 50% of those contests. Um, since she's a high school player who hasn't set foot on a college field ever. Um, and Lizzie Colson's one of the best college defenders, probably the best college defender right now um, in the country, if not the world. Um, I'd be shocked if the average high school kid or even a really good high school kid could beat her five times out of a hundred. Um, so if you have a coach writing endorsements like that, um, you, you can't help but wonder as you're reading it, um, is the coach really giving you an honest evaluation of, of the player's skills and ability? Um, or does the coach really not know how to evaluate a player's skill set? So just be careful who you pick so that they're, again, being positive but honest and giving a fair appraisal of your skill set. You don't necessarily need a coach to say you're the best thing ever. Um, it, in the same kind of vein, you don't want a coach who's going to write you an endorsement and spend a whole paragraph talking about how great you will be playing D1 lacrosse, um, particularly if you're not sure where you might want to go to school or what level you might want to consider playing lacrosse because if your coach is writing an endorsement that's all about D1, 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 there's potentially a lot of D2, D3, NAIA coaches who might have been interested in you who will assume reading that endorsement that your coach is writing that because you are only interested in D1. And so now they're not really going to pay much attention or try to recruit you when they otherwise might have expressed more interest because they think it's not a good use of their time. So just be careful with those kinds of things. Um, myth five, I don't need to start the recruiting process till I'm an upperclassman or until I know where I wanna to go to college. Um, and that's not true either. It's the earlier you start, the more options you'll have, the more time you have to get lists together, to build relationships with coaches. So the sooner you can start, the better. Um, most kids are best off starting when they're getting ready to start their freshman year. Um, on the other hand, not to discourage kids, if you're a little bit older, you're going into your junior year, you're going into your senior year, it doesn't mean it's too late for you to start, but you're gonna have to move fast and do some catching up in terms of getting a profile built and reaching out to coaches. So there are still opportunities out there for you. Um, don't give up, but for those of you who are younger, don't wait. If if you have any time at all now, now is the time to get started um, so that you're ready to go. And as you get older, you'll have access to more coaches. We'll kind of talk in a little bit about what the deadlines are for NCAA in terms of coach contact. But um, the sooner you start at least getting a profile up and starting reaching out to coaches, getting a film together, those kinds of things, the better off you are. 
So these are the kinds of things we need to do to get started. Um, we need to set up our recruiting profile, get a highlight reel together fast, um, start researching some of these colleges and programs, um, plan what kinds of upcoming events and activities might be best for you to go to get seen by the coaches and colleges you're interested in, um, and then start reaching out to coaches to build those relationships. So with recruiting profiles, there's there are a whole lot of options. These are probably the three biggest ones for lacrosse. Um, NCS, NCSA is Next College Student Athlete. Um, they're ncsasports.org and they um, are a partner with USA Lacrosse. Um, they have an app, they have a whole lot of um, resources, options, those kinds of things for kids. They have a really robust um, mechanism built within their software for kids to really kind of hone down what types of colleges they might be interested in. They have a lot of information about the colleges for kids to search and learn about the different schools. Um, and they have a nice matching service we'll kind of talk about in a little bit. NCSA, you can create a profile and you can set it up free and you can keep a free profile for years if you want. Um, they have kind of a freemium sort of model. So you can do the free profile that has all the basics that you would need. Um, if you want extra support from their staff, um, which are typically former college athletes, um, if you want to be able to message coaches and do more contact within their system, um, there are paid services for that. But most of what they provide you can get for years with the free profile. So I don't want anyone to think you have to spend a lot of money to build a recruiting profile. You can go to NCSA, you can build one for free. Um, Pete's asking what the cost is for NCSA. So NCSA varies um, because they have several tiers. So your best bet is to initially set up a free profile. Um, and you, again, you can do that for years and never pay them a penny. Then they have different packages um, that cost different amounts and you get more services and more individual attention. Um, typically, and they give discounts for um, military members, veterans, teachers, all kinds of stuff. So there's a huge variation in terms of what it might cost someone, but anywhere from, you could pay anywhere from 800 to $3,000 um, to get support for four years through high school. Um, again, you can get a basic profile that does everything you need to do for free. Your best bet is to set up the free profile. Then what NCSA will do is to verify that you're legitimate and you're serious, they will want to schedule a phone call with the student and the athlete, I mean, the student athlete and their parents. Um, and it's basically a sales pitch where they'll go over all their different tiers and talk about the different costs uh, for those services and, and where they provide, you know, this many special sessions, if they'll do this many videos for you, you know, and the next package might do more. And they'll kind of talk about that. You don't have to buy anything. They'll verify you whether you buy anything or not. Um, from my experience with NCSA and with lots of other people who have had experience with them, um, they'll probably kill me for saying this. Your best bet is to tell them, no, it's too expensive. You can't afford it. And they will 99.999% of the time immediately drop the price. They will find a way to give you a discount. Um, you once worked for this company. It's a Sunday. They're starting a promo next week. <laughs> um, they will almost always figure out a way to offer you a discounted price. So there's that. Um, Connect Lax um, has a lot of the same services. They don't have an app like NCSA, but, but they have a website. They have um, very similar services, um, webinars, those kinds of things um, to help kids kind of figure out what they should have on their profile. Um, help researching colleges, all of those kinds of things, just like NCSA. Connect Lax, you can set up a profile free for about 30 to 60 days. It's only a short term. Um, but the folks who started Connect Lax, um, they have a partnership with what used to be the WPLL, now Athletes Unlimited. 
um, they really believed that more kids needed access to recruiting services and support cheaper. So it's something like eight or nine dollars a month after the free trial. So it's extremely affordable for most families. Um, and you just pay as long as you need it. Um, but again, it's something like 30 or 60 days free trial. And then um, the last I looked not too long ago was eight or nine dollars a month. So it's very reasonable for most families. If you don't want to drop a few thousand dollars to get extra support from NCSA, you, you know, pay connect lacks less than 10 bucks a month. Um, sports recruits is another option. Um, same thing like NCSA and Connect Lacks. Um, they have all the same features. You can put in your academics, athletics, highlight videos. You can research colleges. Um, they have videos, blogs, all kinds of support things to help you figure out um, what, what the right college is for you. Just like NCSA, you can do a pre free profile and you can have the profile free for years. You never have to pay them a penny for the basic profile that has the minimum things you need. Um, you can pay them for more services where they will help like NCSA, they'll help you more with videos, they'll give you more one-on-one um, -on -one support, they'll allow you to message coaches through their system instead of separate emails, which makes for a little bit easier tracking of reaching out with coaches. Um, but again, you can do everything you need on a free profile. You don't have to pay for it. Um, it it's the same kind of thing too. They'll set up a call with the athlete and the parents um, to talk about the services that they provide. Um, when you go through that call, they'll kind of verify for college coaches that it is the profile of a legitimate athlete who is interested in being recruited. Um, and they'll do that whether you buy a package or not. Um, they tend to be less um, hard sales than NCSA, in my opinion. Um, all of these profiles are good. All these services are good. Um, it's really just a matter of preference. A lot of kids trying to get recruited will set up multiple profiles. Um, NCSA and sports recruits are probably the two biggest. Sports recruits is now partnered with IWLCA. Um, so a lot of kids will do both of those. And again, if you want, you can do both of those for free. Once you get one set up, it's really easy to mirror your stuff on the other one. And then when you're just updating for kids, you know, it's an extra five or 10 minutes to update the second one after you've done the first. So it's pretty easy to keep them up. Some coaches prefer NCSA, some coaches prefer sports recruits. So there is some benefit to doing both. Um, but again, you, you can get what you need on any of these services. Um, and with NCSA and sports recruits, you don't have to pay them to get what you need. Um, it, Question online. Okay. Is Connect Lax for boys as well? Yes. Yes. So in fact, um, in Arizona, there are more boys on Connect Lax than Arizona girls. But um, NCSA, Connect Lax, and sports recruits are all boys and girls. But if you set up a sports recruits profile and indicate you're a female lacrosse player, they will link you to IWLCA recruiting. If you're any other sport or you're male, they will not link you to IWLCA. Um, but any of these three services um, are boys and girls, and Connect Lax is obviously just lacrosse, but NCSA and sports recruits, um, all kinds of sports. So if you have other kids doing basketball, volleyball, football, hockey, whatever, they can go on any of these swimming, track. Um, NCSA and sports recruits will do pretty much any sport so that, that colleges recruit for. Oh, all right, my clicker stopped working. So my tech support is gonna have to click for me. Or, oh, no, he got it going. Um, so some basic things you want in a recruiting profile. First thing, whatever service or services you're gonna use, name, contact info, grad year, sport and position that you play. Um, it's a weird quirk with NCAA and some of their rules and those kinds of things. So these recruiting services are set up where you have to put that information in gold 
all of it into your profile or you are not searchable by coaches. So a coach will not be able to find you or anything about you if you do not have at least all of those things in gold on your profile. And it's not that much that a player should be able to do in five minutes. Name, contact info, grad your position. Easy. Um, everything else, it doesn't have to be there for a coach to search and find you and look at your profile. But the more you put, um, the longer coaches will look at your profile, the more coaches will look at your profile, the better off you are. Um, academics. All of the profiles have a place for GPA. Some of them have you just put in one GPA and indicate if it's unweighted or weighted. Um, others like um, NCSA will let you put in separate GPAs. You put in your unweighted GPA, you put in a weighted GPA, you put in your core GPA. And for core, they mean NCAA core. It's those 16 core courses, or if you haven't taken all 16 yet, however many of the core courses you've taken, um, for simplification, core courses are typically um, math, science, English, um, things like um, history, government, civics, foreign languages, world languages, those kinds of things um, are typically considered core courses for most schools for the NCAA. So you can calculate that GPA separately and put it in there as well. Um, you don't have to put in, you know, eight different GPAs calculated however many ways but you should at least put in one GPA, at least one, um, and indicate if it's weighted or not weighted. Um, if, if you're a student athlete who is starting your freshman year of high school, don't put in your middle school GPA. I, I, I hate to say this because I'm an, I'm an academic, I really believe in education. Nobody cares about your middle school grades except you and your parents. It's, I mean, that's the, that's the sad truth. College coaches don't care. They wanna see how you perform in high school. So if you're starting your freshman year of high school, don't worry about it. You don't have a GPA. Just work really hard to get the best grades you can now. Um, if you are going into your sophomore year or later, you have a high school GPA and you have a high school transcript. Um, and most of the high schools by now were enough past the end of the school year, they should have your transcripts posted. Um, if your school uses student view or some other system, you can pull an unofficial copy of your transcript. For now, while you're still in high school and you're just getting started on this process, do not pay for an official transcript to try and post an official transcript on your recruiting profile. Put your GPA, put up your unofficial transcript. College coaches will eventually see your official transcript when you have to give it to the NCAA later, when you apply to their college and go through the admissions process. For now, an unofficial transcript is fine. So do not pay money for an official transcript that you're going to then try and load because by the time you open it to load it up anyway, it's no longer official. So save yourself the trouble and the money. Just throw up an unofficial transcript if you've got one, put your grades up. Um, a lot of coaches want to start looking at your grades by the time you're starting your sophomore year, which means they want to see your freshman grades. Um, by the time you hit the start of your junior year, something like 75% of college coaches are looking, actively looking for your grades. So if you're going into your junior year of high school or later, make sure you have your GPA and your transcripts up there because colleges are looking, they want to see it. And they might kind of dismiss you and stop looking at your profile and move on to the next 10, 15, 20 players, whatever, um, who have GPAs and transcripts up. Because again, if you want to play sports in college, you're going to have to get past not just the coaching recruiting process, you have to get past an admissions committee. Um, so you're going to have to meet the grade and test standard of that institution whatever it is, the sooner you get those things up, the better. Um, all of the recruiting profiles give you the opportunity to indicate, are you taking honors or AP courses? You can list them. Um, if you're doing that, list them. It takes two minutes. Um, test scores. Again, if you're a freshman, you're going to leave it blank. You're not going to have test scores. You're not even going to be able to put in a date of when you're going to test because it's too soon for you to know. Don't worry about it. Coaches are not going to expect a freshman, if they're looking at your profile, to have test scores. 
Um, if you are a junior or senior, if you have taken the SAT or ACT, put your scores up. Um, if you have not taken the SAT or ACT and you're going into your junior or senior year, if you're a senior, register quick. Um, even if you're thinking, because the NCAA is allowing some exceptions with COVID for the testing requirement and a number of colleges are, are allowing exceptions, um, if you can, test anyway. If you think you can't afford it, the SAT and the ACT, both organizations have scholarships for kids in financial need look into that because there are a lot of scholarships out there that want SAT or ACT scores to consider you for a scholarship. So taking that test could open up a lot of money for you. Um, also, let's say there's a particular school you really want to get into and your grades aren't bad, but they're not stellar. You have a 3.6 GPA and most of the students they accept have a much higher GPA. If you have a 3.6 GPA and you study really hard and you get a 1550 on the SATs, you're now in a different pool of candidates. It's just that simple. Um, I've, I've worked in admissions. I've worked on scholarship committees for a long time. A really good test score can do a lot to make your grades look better. Um, it, it's just true. If, you, if your grades aren't quite as high as you want, and you can pull a 34, 35 on the ACT, there are a lot more colleges that will consider you now admissions wise um, because you've tested well. So if there's any way you can take the test, ACT or SAT or both, take at least one. Um, scholarship money, it can open doors for admissions. Um, I would take the test. If you take the PSAT and a lot of schools will have all their students take it and the school covers the cost and you can take it at school for free um, and it's eventually used for consideration for national merit scholarships, those kinds of things. Um, if you're younger and you've taken the PSAT but you haven't yet taken the SAT or ACT, if you have a good PSAT score, put it up there on your recruiting profiles. Let coaches know you're testing well, you're a serious student, um, it can only help you. Um, athletics, all the recruiting profiles have places for you to put your high school team, your club team, um, coach name, contact info, that kind of thing. Um, put up your highlight video, put up statistics. Now, statistics is a tricky thing. Um, when, when the highlight, um, when the recruiting profiles, the services want you to put up your statistics, they mean legitimate, verifiable statistics. So, if your high school league keeps track and you have, you know, scorekeepers and statisticians at the games and they're marking down things like ground balls and draw wins or face off wins, um, assists, goals, those kinds of things, and say the league posts those somewhere on their website. Um, it's usually parent volunteers taking, taking the statistics. We know they're not perfect. You know, people do the best they can, but those are reasonably verifiable statistics because they're on an objective third party website that's indicating that you had, you know, 42 assists in the season or whatever it is. Um, so you can put those kinds of statistics on your recruiting profile if you have them. Again, if you're going into your freshman year, no one cares about middle school, anything, you, you just don't have any statistics yet. And that's fine. Um, you don't want to combine verifiable statistics with unverifiable statistics. So what I mean by that is if your high school league's webpage on statistics says that you have taken 300 draws this season and you won 42 draws this season, do not put on your recruiting profile as a statistic, you win 60% of draws because you think you do a lot better in your club and you win a lot more draws. Um, don't do that. Oh, looks like we have another question. Yeah, Pete's asking if a JV stats book would work for a freshman year, it wouldn't be posted online. So I would say yes, if there's someone that could legitimately sign off on it and you have good stats, yes, you could post it. Just be careful that you're posting where there is some sort of record. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, that's okay. There, there's a stats book, someone's kept it. It's not the player sort of guessing on how they might've done. 
Um, that, so that's probably okay. I, I, I don't think anyone would balk at that. Um, but just be careful that it's good statistics, that you're not combining, guessing. Please don't make things up. Um, you know, if you're better off having no statistics listed than stuff a coach can go look up and see, it's just not the case. Um, on all these profiles, you can indicate events that you're coming to or have been at, tournaments, camps, clinics, showcases, prospect days, all that sort of stuff. Um, one of the reasons players might want to do this on the profile, it takes a few extra minutes and a lot of kids leave it off. I really recommend kids do it and here's why. All these recruiting profile services have very robust search options for college coaches. So a coach can go in there and indicate they're looking for a 2023 who plays this position, who has this GPA or better, who will be at this tournament. Um, you will not show up in the coach's list as a potential person to look at. If you have not listed, you will be at that tournament. Um, but if you have gone in there and listed, you're going to be at that event and you meet the other criteria, you'll show up on the list for the coach and they may come look at you. They may look at your profile and your highlight video. They may reach out to you. But again, if you're missing this information and they're using that in their search, you're now eliminated. So as much information as you can put in there, the better off you are. Um, other things, activities. So you can put other kinds of high school clubs you belong to, if you've got any honors or awards, if you have any kind of press, public service. If you have volunteered at the Humane Society for the past two years, put it on your recruiting profile. If you, you know, bring food to the elderly or, you know, do something at a nursing home, any of those kinds of things. Um, you know, you work with a nonprofit and help kids learn to read. I, I don't care what it is. You can put those things on your recruiting profile um, and it will only help you. Um, there's a place on every one of the profiles, every one of the services for a personal statement. And we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that later. The personal statement is a good thing to have. It's a really good way for a coach to quickly get to know something about you that isn't necessarily all about lacrosse and positions and statistics and those kinds of things. Um, and then for all of them, there's a place where you can put social media handles like Twitter, Instagram, that kind of thing. So coaches can follow you and, and check out what you're doing. Um, so my daughter gave me permission to um, use some screenshots of her profiles as an example. So this one is what it would look like on NCSA for a coach that is logged in. Um, so they'll see her name, they'll see she's a verified athlete, they'll see how many years experience she has. Um, in, in her case, since she's now committed, the committed comes up under her name. If, a, if an athlete's not committed, it just doesn't show up there. Um, under the name, they'll have their um, grad year position, height, weight, those kinds of things. Um, because this is what it would look like for a coach who's logged in, her contact info is up there. Um, the public profile that someone might see if they're not logged in will not have any kind of personal information like contact info, those sorts of things. Um, coaches can see her highlight videos there and they could either scroll down the page or use the menu on the left to click and look at her GPA, her transcripts, her test scores, um, all those kinds of things. They can click on athletics to see her high school, what clubs she's played for, what tournaments she'll be at, all those kinds of things. Um, and again, a coach can scroll down or click on academics and see her grades, test scores, transcripts on the public profile. None of that's visible. What it would tell someone is that they have to be logged in to see that. So for players or parents who might be worried, um, you're child's contact info, their grades, all those kinds of things are not visible to random people just looking through recruiting profiles. Coaches have to be logged in to see that. Um, Connect lacks. Oh, oh, that was weird. Well, we just went way too far. I don't even know how that happened. Sorry about that, my clicker is really angry. 
Okay, let's see, here we are. So this is the second one. This is Connect Wax. Um, so very similar, the interface looks a little bit different, but it has her name, grad year, hometown. Um, the first thing you see is the little like sentence blurb about herself and then the start of a personal statement, a coach could click to read more. Um, then they can scroll down and see her video, see more about her athletics, academics, all those kinds of things. Or just like NCSA, they can use the menu on the left to just click on the individual items. Um, it's in this case, if a coach scrolled down underneath the menu bar on the left is where it'll indicate if a player is committed or not. Um, and it's the same kind of thing like NCSA coaches who are logged in can see contact information, grades, test scores, transcripts, all those kinds of things. Random general people, um, they can see a personal statement, a highlight video, a position, that sort of thing. They cannot see the personal information. Um, and then sports recruits. Um, again, if you're a female lacrosse player, in the upper left, it won't say sports recruits anymore. It'll say IWLCA recruits. If you're male or any other sport, it will still say sports recruits, but it's basically the same system. Um, so it's again, very similar. Um, they have the little tag on the side that indicates if a player is committed or not. Um, a coach can just click the arrow to view her top highlight reel. Um, they see name, grad year, position, um, all those kinds of things. Um, they see her high school, what club she plays for, and same thing, they could scroll down to see all her grades, transcripts, events she's going to, or they can just use the menu bar on the left and just click on what they're interested in. Um, but all of these services are very, very similar in terms of what they provide um, and what athletes can put in about themselves for college coaches to see um, so there isn't one that's just so much better than the rest. Um, they're all really good. They'll all do what you need. Pick one, pick multiple ones, um, whatever works for you, but you don't have to pay a lot of money. Again, um, Connect Lax is really inexpensive. Uh, sports recruits and, I, and uh, NCSA, you don't have to pay. You can do free profiles that do a ton of stuff. Um, so if you want to find sample profiles, um, there are a few ways to do it. So you can kind of see what you think looks good and what you might want to model on your, on your own profile. NCSA is a little bit cumbersome. Um, you go to ncsasports.org and then slash, and you put the sports recruiting. So in the case of women's lacrosse, it's women's-lacrosse-recruiting. For men's, it's men's-lacrosse-recruiting. Um, slash, and you can put a state, Arizona, California, Colorado, whatever. Um, after that, it gives you kind of a menu on the web where you can drop down and pick a city, pick a random school, pick a random kid, look at their profile. Again, you're not going to see their grades and transcripts and test scores and personal contact info, but you could check out their highlight reel. You could check out, do they have a personal statement? Those sorts of things you can kind of check out. Um, and so for a lot of students, it gives them a good idea if they look at a few personal statements, look at a few highlight reels, um, what might work for them. In terms of looking at other profiles and comparing, I actually like using Connect Lax the best. And the reason why is you just go to connectlax.com slash recruit search. And it gives you a menu bar on the left where you can pick. So you can do all lacrosse players or you can separate men from women. You can separate by grad year. You can type in a zip code and say you want to see everyone within X number of miles of your zip code. Um, but there are all kinds of things you can just select. Um, for most kids, it's easier to just do all men or all women within a certain number of miles from your zip code and just click and see. And you'll get a bunch of kids come up from all over the country. Again, if you, if you do Arizona, any kind of Arizona zip code and girls, you're gonna get less than half a dozen Arizona female lacrosse players. And after that, everything's California, Colorado, Texas, that kind of thing. Um, boys, there are, there are more Arizona players. And then you start going California, Colorado, Texas, same sort of thing. Um, but it's a really easy way to just get a whole bunch of kids populate and you can just look at their profiles real quick. 
and look at the first minute or two of someone's highlight reel, quick read their personal statement and get a sense of what looks good, what sounds good to you, what kinds of things you may or may not want to do on your profile. Sports recruits, um, for boys, you just leave off the IWLCA. For girls, it's IWLCA.sportsrecruits.com slash athlete slash, and their naming convention is first underscore last for names. Um, but there, it really only helps you if you're looking at the profile of someone you know. And if someone has a common name, then they'll have a weird numbering system after the last name. And so you might not be able to easily find them. Um, the easiest way is to just look at random profiles on Connect Lax. Just do the quick search, look. You can look at a bunch of defenders in your grad year only, or a bunch of attack players of any grad year. You, so you can kind of pick like that um, and you can see what sort of things look good, what doesn't, and make some decisions on what you wanna do. Um, but again, the most important things you want on your recruiting profile, your contact info so coaches can reach out to you, what positions you play, your grades and transcripts if you've got them, personal statement, and then highlighter skills video. For a highlight video, three to four minutes in length, don't really go over four minutes. Coaches, they've stopped watching by then. If your eight minute highlight reel, no one's watching the eight minutes except your parents um, or maybe your grandparents. 20 to, 20 to 25 of your best plays. You might, if they're short plays, be able to get 30, 35 in there, but for the most part, 20 to 25 of your best plays. Um, no matter what your position, you should show both offense and defense. Ideally, varsity or high-end club footage. Um, and by high-end club footage, again, I don't mean you have to pay, play for the best team in the state, region, country, um, but real games at real tournaments. If your club has a couple of teams and you did a scrimmage, not that footage. Even if you, you know, paid some reps to kind of come and keep things under control, no. Um, real tournaments, real games, that sort of thing. Um, don't get hung up on the varsity thing. If, if you're playing your freshman year JV um, and that's the footage you have, put up what you have. It's better than nothing. But as soon as you have varsity footage, as soon as you have club footage from more competitive games, start putting those things up in your highlight reels. But right now, if what you have is JV footage, put it up there. It's some footage is better than no footage. Um, ideally high resolution and either use appropriate music or no music at all. Um, it should go without saying, and I hate to say it, but I know of situations where coaches have watched a highlight reel and all kinds of profanity or racial slurs or whatever have come up in the music and they've just crossed the kid right off their list. So appropriate music or none at all. It, you know, if you're not sure, none at all. Yes. So Yeah, just comment from Pete that uh, he's heard of some coaches that don't like highlight videos and would prefer to watch a whole game to really watch how a player plays. Um, but, you know, can't see a coach really watching a full game. Uh, maybe you can comment on that and um, coaches so, that ask for times during games. Yeah, so that's true. Um, as a general rule, though, coaches don't want a bunch of kids to just send them full games. Um usually when they want a full game, it's they've already seen a little bit of a kid either through a highlight reel, through five minutes at a tournament, through a little bit of time at a prospect day, and now they want more. And that's true. So you can put up on any of these recruiting profiles or you can send to coaches separately an entire game or a half of a game if that's what they want and put down in the notes what times um, are where your near the ball or most involved in the play or whatever it is. So that's true. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you post a full game or a half game for coaches on your recruiting profile, just make sure you've labeled it that way so that coaches who just want a quick highlight reel know which one they're supposed to look at. Um, and if you're sending coaches film, 
don't send a, a coach half a game or a full game until they ask for it. Um, because it, it is true. Some of them will ask for that. Some of them don't want it. Don't send it to them until they ask for it. But, but yeah, some, some coaches will ask for that. Um, it's not uncommon, but typically they've already seen you a little bit and now they're more interested. Um, if you're a goalie, you want to show a variety of saves, side to side mo movement, accurate outlets and clears. Um, coaches do not need to see you chuck the ball way beyond the midfield, nowhere near any of your players. They don't care how far you can throw it if you can't throw it accurately. Um, stance, how you set up and approach shots, those are the kinds of things you want in your highlight video. Um, if you're a defender, 1v1 one 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 defense with change of direction, team defense, can you communicate, slides, double teams, clean and accurate checks, speed and agility, ground balls, clears, long passes, turning a ball carrier, picking up the ball and ball carrier on a fast break. Um, you should have some of all of those things in your video if you're a defender. And especially for the girls, I can't stress enough, the clean and accurate check thing. If, if you are playing defense and your girl beats you and you have your stick one-handed and you hold it way up here and you send the stick all the way down and you hit her stick and it just looks so cool because it went flying, I don't care if the official called it or not. That's a slash. It's really bad decision making. That does not need to be in your highlight reel. Um, unfortunately, I've seen it happen a few times. Don't do it. Don't put anything in your highlight reel that suggests you don't make good decisions under pressure. Um, attack. If you're attack, you want to show a variety of dodges, 1v1 to cage, both goals and assists. Um, a variety of shot placement, a variety of fakes, ball handling under pressure, um, right and left hand stick skills, a variety of shot angles, um, and show how you respond on the ride. Most college coaches have no use for an attack player who cannot ride. It's part of your job. So put it in your reel. The biggest mistake I've seen attack players make, um, boys and girls, is you turn on their highlight reel and, oh, look, Jane shoots. Oh, look, Jane shoots again. There's Jane. What's she doing? She's shooting again. And it's 18 shots in a row, all to the upper right corner of the cage, all from roughly the same spot on the field. Um, don't do it. Show a variety of dodges, fakes, goals, and assists. And you may be an attack player that has a lot more goals than assists. You may be the opposite, the player with more assists than goals. Either of those things is fine, but all of you should be showing some of each. Midfield, it, it's hard for midfielders to do highlight reels. You just have to be careful and pick the best stuff you have. You've got to show your transition game. You've got to show draws and circle play. Um, if you're a male lacrosse player, you want to be showing the face off and where you're at with the wings and what you're doing. Um, and then boys or girls, you've got to show both offense and defense. So everything from the defense list and everything from the attack list, um, get as much of that in there as you can. Um, and again, with midfield, you've got two to four minutes. You might not get quite everything, but get as much from all those lists as you can to show that you're well-rounded and that you can play the full range of the midfield. I know with, with boys, it's a little bit different because a lot of kids specialize. They're more of an offensive midfielder or a defensive midfielder. Um, so if that's the case for you and you have more of a specialty, stick with what's on the midfield list and then either attack or defense, whatever is more your focus. Um, for girls, you've kind of got to do it all because they don't really do that specialization um, right now. Um, if you do not have good game film to do a highlight reel, if you're a younger player, you're just getting started, you can go in the backyard, go to a park, get a parent, older sibling, someone to help you and film you doing some demo drills and put together a skills-based video to at least get something started for coaches to look at. Um, Kylie Olmiller on her KO17 app has some really good drills um, that you can do and film. 
Shake School um, also has a lot of really good options. Um, so with Shake School, you can do a free trial. You don't have to pay for their content or quite frankly, you can just go to Instagram because they post a lot of drills on their posts or kids will tag them doing their drills. Um, and you can just look and copy some of those and do some of those drills um, and just film it and put up a skills video. Uh, NCSA and Sports Recruits both also have some guides and videos to help kids put together a skills video if they don't have a lot of game film. And again, that's something you can do at home or a local park. So if you don't have a lot of game film, put up a skills video so you've at least got something for coaches to see what you can do. Um, when you're ready to do a personal statement on your recruiting profile, you really just need seven to 10 sentences, one or two paragraphs. Your goal is to show the coach who you are as a person. Um, the most important thing I can say is you need to say something about yourself that is different from everything else on your recruiting profile. Don't waste your time in the personal statement telling coaches that you're name is Jill and you've played the cross six years and you're a midfielder and you know you love lacrosse and you go to this school and you work really hard presumably they're getting all of that information from other places on your profile tell them something else interesting about yourself that they couldn't figure out or see directly on your profile so if you're really into some sort of extracurricular activity um if you're obsessed with a particular, I don't know, author or whatever it is, say something about yourself that's unique and interesting, that gives them a sense of who you are, that isn't right there on your profile. Um, you can say things that will share personal strengths or interests, whatever you like, but it really needs to be something that lets a coach see who you are as a person that they can't figure out just by looking at your profile. Um, once you've kind of got, you've picked a recruiting service, you've got your profile up, you're starting to get going, you want to research colleges. Um, you can do that at college websites directly. Another really great way to do it is to use NCSA, use Connect Lax, use Sports Recruits, and use their tools to search for colleges. Um, they have all kinds of information. They'll tell you um, the location of the college, if it's urban, suburban, rural, how big it is, um, what the cost is, do they have a religious affiliation, you know, do they have majors you might be interested in, if you've indicated what your major that you're interested in might be, um, all kinds of stuff. And it's just really easy to get a lot of information about the colleges from these recruiting services. And so you can kind of start narrowing down what you might be interested in, what colleges look good. Um, Spark Consulting and some other places like that, um, you don't have to pay for their services. They put a lot of stuff up free with information about particular colleges. Um, Spark Consulting tends to focus on colleges and universities that have rowing programs, but the information about the school that holds true no matter what sport a player is interested in. So if you're, if you might be interested in a, in a college or university that has a lacrosse team that also has a rowing team, Spark Consulting probably has a ton of information on that school. Um, you just sort of ignore their rowing specific pages and you look at just the college information. Um, you can look at college rankings, but I kind of take those with a grain of salt. Um, Ask guidance counselors, um, ask high school coaches, um, teachers, you can family members, friends, you can get all kinds of information about colleges from just reaching out to people in general. Um, what kinds of things you wanna consider? Um, colleges have to post their retention rates. So students who show up in the fall semester of their freshman year, what percent of them show up the fall semester of their sophomore year? Um, the higher the number, the better. Um, where is the school? How big is the school? Um, for some kids, that matters a lot. Um, I, I will say, though, it's kind of one of those things where you need to kind of consider the nuance of a situation and not just look at the numbers. So if you're a student who doesn't want to go to a really small school where you feel isolated and you're saying there's no way I'm going to a school with fewer than 10,000 students, um, 
the Claremont colleges, Claremont McKenna, um, Scripps, Harvey Mudd, Pomona, Pitzer, and then there are a couple of other grad colleges. Um, all of them have about 2000 students or less, but there's seven of them and they're all right next to each other and their campuses aren't separated. They, they connect to one another openly. So it's seven colleges, but even though each one is very small, combined, you're surrounded where there are 10,000 or more students right there. So even though any one of those schools is small, you don't get a feel of a very small school if you go to one of those schools because they're all right next to each other. Kids from one school can take classes at another school. They do it all the time. Um, so kind of consider those sorts of things. They're also in the LA area. So it's one of those things where they may be smaller schools, but you don't feel isolated because it's LA, it's huge. Question? Yeah, Pete's asking if a college alum can help at all if they're non-family members. Yes. Um, it will vary from school to school, but um, for a lot of schools, alumni writing letter of recommendations, um, those kinds of things can help. And alumni can certainly give students advice on the application process or introduce them to people. So that can absolutely help. Alumni can absolutely help. Um, other things to kind of consider, what type of school is it? How selective? What kind of majors they have? Um, can you do internships? Can you study abroad? What's the housing like? Um, safety, cost. Um, the only other thing I'd say about that with cost is don't let cost alone, oops, deter you. Ugh. Okay, my clicker hates me. Um, a lot of times you might look, uh, I'll use Occidental for example. Um, if you look at Occidental, it's about $80,000 a year for everything, tuition, books, room and board, all that kind of stuff. You're coming in close to $80,000 a year. Um, no one actually pays $80,000 a year to go to Oxy. They have a great endowment. They have fantastic financial aid. Um, and a lot of schools like them guarantee to meet 90 to 100% of a family's financial need. So cost is definitely something to consider but a lot of the more expensive private schools have a lot more financial aid. Um, so you could end up going to a private college and paying less than you would at a public institution. So kind of consider that as well. Um, in the end, by the time you're getting ready to make a decision, ideally you wanna be down to around 10 colleges, two or three reach schools, four or five target schools, two to three safety schools. Um, reach schools academically are any school that accepts less than 15% of applicants or require very high percentiles on test scores. So even if you're a 4.0 student with a 1580 out of 1600 on the SAT, Stanford is still a reach school for you because they turn down kids with perfect GPAs every day. They turn down kids with perfect SAT scores. Um, you're more likely to get in the better your grades and test scores, but there's no guarantee. It's still a reach school. It's just super competitive. That's the way it is. Um, target schools tend to have GPAs and test scores around the 50th percentile um, and safety schools. Those are generally 75th percentile. Um, and so they're easier for most students to get into. They tend to be less selective, but you kind of want a mix um, of schools in terms of Athletic fit, that's a little bit different. Um, NCSA actually has a really good tool for that. If you do build an NCSA profile, you can go in and click on any college. And when you get to the college page, um, kind of in the upper right under the little banner with the name of the college, there'll be a, a tab that says match analysis. And you can click on that and a page will come up and this will come up for any college that has your sport that you click on. If you've submitted some sort of highlight reel, um, usually within a couple weeks of you submitting, NCSA has staff that are experts in your sport that will evaluate and give you, an they'll, they'll evaluate your athletic skill and they'll put you in a certain range. 
Um, so what will happen is when you click the match analysis, you'll see the bar with the range that the college is recruiting for, and then you'll see your bar and where you are, and you'll see if they overlap at all. So you'll see if you're a good athletic fit. And then beneath that, they'll, they'll show you the range of GPAs that most students have at that school, and they'll put a little pin where you are. Um, and they'll do the same for SAT, ACT, that kind of thing. So you can see with their match analysis really easily if you're a good academic fit or athletic fit with that school. And that is an amazing tool. Um, and I will say for players and parents, um, one of the best things to do is compare different schools because like, I love this chart. A lot of people think D1 is the best and then D2 is the next best and then D3 and then NAIA and then junior college or club or whatever. Um, the reality is there's a huge overlap. There are D2 teams that could beat a lot of D1 teams. There are D3 teams that could beat a lot of D1 teams. Heck, Tufts this past year, D3 did beat some D1 teams. Um, they're very proud of it. Um, there are some club teams that are so good, they could be D1, two or three teams, depending on the school. Um, NAIA is not better or worse than NCAA. It's just a different governing body. There are very good schools and there are very good teams. Um, it, it just really kind of depends on what, what you're looking for. But one of the nice things about the match analysis with, with NCSA is you can go look and you can click on some D1 schools and you can go click on some D2, some D3, some NAIA, and you will find there are some D3 schools that are recruiting a much higher level of athletic talent than some D1 schools or D2 schools. Um, so you can really see the range. Um, D3 schools, um, they tend to be smaller. They tend to be more of the smaller private liberal arts colleges, those kinds of things. Um, but there are a lot of D3 schools that are phenomenal schools in terms of education, schools like MIT, University of Chicago. Um, so it's, I would suggest to kids consider D1, D2 and D3 schools, consider NAIA schools. Um, I, I've said to my kids in the years past, quite frankly, um, if they could play for a not great D1 lacrosse team at a college that's not a very good school, and the alternative was say playing club lacrosse at UCLA. For me, one of these choices is a much better choice and it's play club lacrosse at UCLA. Um, there are a lot of really good schools at every level, D1, 2, 3, NAIA. Um, the best advice I can give to kids, and this is from having worked in higher ed for a really long time. When you go through this process, just remember you are not going to college to play lacrosse. You are going to college to get the best education you and your family can afford. And if you're lucky, you're going to get to play lacrosse while you're there. And that's great. But you're going to college to get the best education you can. So go to the college that the, that's the right fit. And if it's D1 and you're happy, that's great. If it's D3, great. Go to the best school for you and don't get hung up on what division it is. Or if it's NCAA or NAIA. Um, the NAIA thing is hard. Scotty Pippen played for the NAIA. He was totally underrated as a basketball player, um, as a pro, because, you know, he's playing with Michael Jordan. It's hard to look good. But he was an amazing basketball player, a very successful player. Um, he's got lots of world championship rings, and he was an NAIA kid. Um, there's nothing wrong with the NAIA. And my clicker hates me again. So my tech support's going to have to help me. Okay, um, another great thing to do, and on this list, it's just the girls' programs. Um, but if you go to thegrowthblog.blogspot.com, it's on the screen, and then up in the left-hand corner, you can click on new varsity programs. They list men's and women's new upcoming college programs. Um, this is just the girls' list, but these are new girls' lacrosse programs for 2022 and 2023. Um, that's a really good resource for boys and girls wanting to play college lacrosse because the folks that, that do this blog, they keep up with this. 
So as they get the breaking news, they're posting information about the new programs. And one of the reasons that's really important is if there's a particular region of the country you want to go to, um, or if no matter what I've said, your heart is just absolutely set on playing at a particular division level or whatever, um, the truth is with new programs, um, they have more roster spots because they have to fill an entire team. They have more flexibility with athletic money because they haven't given any out yet. Um, so I'm not going to say it's easier to play for a newer program, but um, it's still a lot of hard work, but there's probably a little more opportunity and a little more flexibility. So it's certainly worth checking those out. Um, coach communication. Um, you want to send coaches an intro email telling them who you are, something about yourself, maybe send a short highlight reel clip, that kind of thing. Um, before tournaments or camps, you want to let, send them an email, let them know you're coming, um, ask if they can watch you, those kinds of things. Um, if they have come to watch you, send them post-tournament or camp emails, thank them for camp, whatever it is. Um, athletes, you should be doing this yourself. Your parents should not be reaching out to coaches on your behalf. Not at all. Um, you can do phone calls, in-person visits, but for most kids, you kind of start with the emails. Um, and I will email everyone after this session handouts that kind of give you um, information and sample emails you can send to a coach. Um, don't just sort of fill in the blank, personalize them um, to sort of fit you and your interests and the, the coach that you're interested in. I, I will say this, I kind of beat it into my kids over and over. And when I've worked with college kids on applications, um, for college programs, um, grad schools, you know, jobs, internships, whatever, to make sure you double check and triple check that you have the right name and the right college or the right name and the right company or whatever it is. But um, for recruiting purposes, the right coach's name and the right college and the right information about why you really want to go to that school, why you think you might be a good fit for that school or athletic program, um, Double check, triple check before you hit send because you don't want to send an email to one coach telling, you know, you don't want to send an email to the Stanford coach and then reference Berkeley or the other way around. Um, and it's funny, I, I have told all my kids and all the students I've worked with over and over and over again not to make that mistake. And my daughter Peyton was going through this process and she had a phone call one day with a coach that she'd been emailing for a while. And she knew this coach had several calls set up that day. And she went through the call with the coach and it went really well. And she emailed the coach afterwards, thanking the coach for her time on the call, et cetera. And the coach emailed her back. And the email that the coach sent back to my daughter, Peyton was hi Molly, followed by how great the call was. So now in our house, we refer to it as a Molly moment <laughs> where my daughter kind of learned firsthand, this doesn't feel great. You understand how it happens, but it's not a good look. So I would just say double check, triple check, make sure the coach's name and the school are correct. Yeah. So Doug just asking for more clarification on why uh, parents shouldn't reach out, but the athletes should do it. And is it, um around just the athlete looking more responsible or is there more to it than that? Well, it's a couple of things. One, whether a player is D1, D2, D3, NAI, whatever, you get to college and these kids are going to have a lot on them. They're going to have to manage academically and athletically and their parents aren't going to be around. And so college coaches need to see that these kids can step up and take care of their own business and that they're prepared and they're ready and they can make their own decisions, do their own stuff, follow through all of those kinds of things. Um, but also quite frankly, they're not recruiting you. They're recruiting your child if you're a parent and they want to get to know your child and see if your child is a good fit. Um, now, that, that doesn't mean there's never a time or place. A lot of times when a coach is interested in a kid, they might invite them to come do a tour and invite the whole family. Um, you know, near the end of the tour, they ask if you have any questions. Let your kid ask most of the questions. If you have questions about things like, you know, 
does the team help provide some academic support to their players? Um, are the are the athletes housed with other athletes? Are they housed with other kids in general? Are there rules regarding these kinds of things? Those sorts of questions is perfectly okay for parents to ask. But parents should not be calling coaches or emailing coaches saying, hey, look at my kid's highlight reel. Hey, my kid's going to be at this tournament. You should come watch them. Um, the coach doesn't even know if the kid is interested or if this is just some parent who is absolutely determined to get their kid into Notre Dame or whatever it is. Um, so have, have, make sure your kids um, are reaching out themselves to the coaches. Um, make sure your kids know, certainly as, you know, a parent of a daughter, um, there's nothing wrong with telling your kid, hey, if you do ever have an experience where a coach says something to you that makes you a little uncomfortable, you can come to me and let me know. That's a different situation. Um, fortunately, I don't hear about that happening often, hardly ever. Um, usually it's a misunderstanding kind of thing, but it, certainly your child can always come to you if they're concerned, if there's a problem, but for the most part, your kids should be managing that process themselves. Um, if you're not using a paid recruiting profile service to manage emails with coaches within the system, and again, you don't have to, um, just use a recruiting dedicated email address. We typically recommend first name, last name, grad year at whatever, gmail.com, you know, Yahoo, what, whatever someone wants to use, who cares? Um, and then just tag or folders for all the different colleges and coaches your kid's communicating with so that they can kind of keep track. Um, but you, again, you don't have to do a paid service. It is easier though to do a dedicated email. One, first name, last name, grad year is reasonably professional. So there won't be anything in your email that might offend a coach or concern a coach. Um, when a coach gets an email from that email address, they know right away it's recruiting related. They know right away what grad year they're looking at so they can immediately make a determination. What kinds of things can I or can I not say to this kid based on their year? Um, those kinds of things. So it just makes it easy for coaches. Um, some best practices, tell them interesting things about yourself. Um, you know, make sure your information's correct. All, you know, all those kinds of things. Tell them why the school or program's a good fit for you. Um, it, this is all kind of good advice that the NCSA has put together. Um, again, sports recruits and Connect Lacks have similar charts for kids to kind of help them figure out um, what might work best for them. Um, social media, um, we're almost done. I know we're getting low on time. Um, athletes, you should definitely clean up your social media. Go in and double check. Just make sure there's nothing inappropriate. Um, check your privacy settings, those kinds of things. Make sure anyone you're following is posting appropriate content, those sorts of things. And you want to send a consistent message. You want to be positive. Just make sure your social media is clean because coaches will follow you. They will look. Um, and even beyond that, at a lot of selective colleges, at some point, admissions officers are going through all your social media looking. Um, and they have had a more positive view of some students based on their social media. And they have opted not to extend admission offers to students because of their social media. So make sure you're in the first group and not the last group. Um, phone, if you do have a phone call with a coach, consider it like a job interview. Um, it, it begins at the start of the call. Um, go somewhere where you're not interrupted, ask good questions, say thank you. Um, coaches will often ask these kinds of questions. They'll ask just like a job interview, tell me about yourself. It's that couple of minutes, tell them something interesting. Um, don't tell them what's in your profile. They already know that. Um, they'll ask for strengths, weaknesses, academic goals. What are you looking for in a team? Be prepared to answer those kinds of questions. Um, the what are your weaknesses is a minefield. Your best bet is to be honest about a weakness and tell them the kinds of things you do to help overcome it. Um, don't do the whole, um, I'm a perfectionist thinking because you say that, that means it's not really a weakness. Being a perfectionist really actually is a weakness. Um, so don't just make up stuff like that. Tell them honestly what a weakness is and what you do to kind of mitigate it. Um, what kinds of questions you should prepare to ask a coach? There are all kinds of things, but here are some examples. 
Um, ask them what they're looking for in an athlete in your position, what kinds of improvements you can make if they've already seen you play. Um, do they have athletes with your major? Um, how many players they're recruiting from your grad year? What's the team culture like? All those kinds of things you can ask. Don't ask them how much money they're going to give you. But at some point after you've had a few conversations with a coach, it's okay to ask them if there are still scholarships available for your graduate year or if they help athletes get additional money like need-based financial aid or merit aid or whatever it is. You can ask them about next steps in the process. Um, if you see them in person, same thing. Consider it like a job interview. As soon as you get off a plane or step on campus, you are in the interview. Dress appropriately, ask thoughtful questions. Again, don't get off the plane and ask how much money am I getting. Um, you know, be prepared with good answers and good questions. And again, say thank you. Um, the eligibility center, you want to register by your junior year. If you're past that point and you haven't registered, just do it quick. Uh, it does cost money, but the NCAA does, again, have financial aid and fee waivers for kids who can't afford it. Um, get in there as soon as you can. Um, the NAI has its own eligibility center. It's a similar situation. So if you're interested in one of those schools, go to their eligibility center. Um, some key dates. D1 can talk to you about recruiting after September 1 of your junior year. D2 is June 15th after the sophomore year. Um, and that's when the coaches can have recruiting conversations. They're limited in terms of the calls. They can make verbal offers. Um, by the time you're a senior, you can do official visits. Um, this year for 2022s, the signing period opens November 10th, and that's when players can actually sign a national letter of intent and a verbal commitment becomes a written commitment. Um, every year it's around um, the second week of November, but it varies depending on how the calendar falls. I think last year it was the 11th, and before that it was the 13th or something, so they vary a little bit, but this year it's the 10th for seniors. Um, just a note, if a D1 coach from a top program is really interested in you before you're an upperclassman, they'll reach out to your club or high school coaches and figure out a way to get a hold of you that is NCAA allowed. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, quick scholarships, lacrosse, both men's and women's, it's an equivalency sport, not a headcount sport. So you're not getting a full ride athletic scholarship. That's almost unheard of um, for men it's a little more than 12 or a little more than 10 for d1 and d2 for women it's 12 and 10 exactly um, so they have the equivalent of that number of scholarships and they have to split it um, with all their players however they see fit so some kids get more some get less some don't get any um, you can get merit money and need-based money on top of that but almost nobody gets a full uh, athletic scholarship so don't expect that um, just a note, the Ivy League, even though they're D1 and can give athletic money, they don't. It's a decision they made as a league. Um, on the other hand, schools like Yale have made the decision that they will meet 100% of financial need. So if you really want to go to a school like that, don't worry about it. They do a really good job of meeting your financial need, and you could go there for free without a penny of athletic money um, if you're a good enough athlete and good enough academically. Um, this is the last thing. What colleges and coaches really want to know, and this is the most important thing, are you prepared to succeed? So can you begin performing academically and athletically immediately? Can you continue in your growth and development? Are you ready to go? Um, will they like having you around for the next four years? So when you go visit the campus, do you get along with the coaches? Do you get along with the admissions officers, the tour guides, your fellow teammates? Um, are you a likable kid? Are you coachable? Um, Will you represent the college and team well? Um, and that's one of the most important things because you really are, when you wanna be recruited as an athlete, you are applying for a job. And the job is you're gonna put on a uniform with the school's color, mascot, logos, whatever. And you're gonna represent that school publicly, potentially on national TV. And they would like to know with absolute certainty that you're not gonna do something really stupid and embarrass them. That they, that's the most important thing. They want to know you're gonna represent them well and you're gonna make them look good. So just kind of keep that in mind as you do your social media, as you do your recruiting profile, be honest, be accurate, um, be yourself, but, 
but be positive um, and put forth the best person that you are. Um, always say thank you to coaches. Do the best you can um, to really represent yourself well and convince these coaches and later admissions officers that you are not going to embarrass that school, that you're going to make them look good. Um, and if you can do that, you're much more likely to get recruited and you're much more likely to get admitted to college. Um, so again, we're kind of out of time. If anyone has other questions, um, type them in and I can try and answer them real quick or just send us an email, southmountainlax at gmail.com and I'll try and answer those questions. Um, if you're registered, I'll send you the um, handouts with a lot of this information. Um, if you're not registered, go to southmountainlax.com, college prep, and register so I can send you the handouts. Um, but otherwise, that's pretty much a lot of information in a short period of time, but recruiting kind of 101 in a nutshell, um, the most important stuff to get started. Any final questions? Hey, Devin. Hey. Thank you so much. This is really cool. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, very, uh, really, uh, really eye opening. So I really <laughs> appreciate this. And uh, thank you. Um, you know, I'm, my son's a, two years older than my daughter, and they're both kind of interested in college and lacrosse. And so it's, it's, um, you know, really beneficial. So thank you so much for doing this. Really oh, you're welcome. I know it's a lot coming at you fast, but oh, it's just a lot kids have to do fast. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, thanks again. And I uh, really appreciate it. Great job. Oh, you're welcome. Chris, I'm going to hit you up with some highlight videos. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right.